welcome to The Collectors. I'm Kent Lund, your host. Today, a very interesting guest on the show, Buttons. Going back 200 years, actually 500 years. Buttons for clothing, next on The Collectors. Well, my guest today is Sherry DeCrew. Buttons, can you imagine? Hi, Sherry. Thank you for coming in. Really, Hi. really appreciate it. Nice to see you today. What got you started on this? Well, I think like a lot of people, um, young people, my mother had a button jar. Oh, she yeah. was a sewer. Oh, it was okay. in her sewing machine. I got to take it out and play with it. Sure. And I re always remembered that. And then I became, as I, um, when I went through college, I became a school librarian. And around 1919, a book called The Button Box came out. It was about a little boy playing in his grandmother's button box. So, of course, okay. being in the library, I got to read that book to the kids all the time and just found out again how fascinated they were in buttons. Kind a of lot had of people forgotten. have button boxes. They do. They really. They do. So then not I got. Like, not like these. No. <laughs> then I got the idea that what I do with my buttons is that I would help interest kids in literature and in history ah. and in science. Oh, good move. Okay. And I actually wrote a curriculum for the library involving all those three subject areas and using buttons and books to introduce kids to all that. Very interesting, Good, uh, a so great that, way to do it. It was, and then the Troy Historical Society had a Saturday workshop for daughters and mothers, and I took my daughter, and that's when I became a true button collector. Okay. So it's been about 15 years. Oh, wow. and you, you've really got a lot of buttons here. Right. A lot of different styles, we'll talk about the different styles and maybe a little bit about where they were made and where they were most popular. Right. You've got something on the easel here. Right. Um, well, buttons, you know, are miniature works of art and they're also history. And so what I thought today is I'd start with my oldest button, which would be the button up top. It is a bone button. It's a five hole bone button. It's probably from the late um, 1600s, early 1700s. And of course they were able to use cattle bone and different kinds of bones to make their buttons then. Now today, if you see bone buttons, what would you'd see is something like this. They're kind of two hole. They are used a lot of in reenactment. Oh, God. Civil sure. War. Civil War. Okay. And of course, that, those are Civil War? Right. And the Long Johns. You know, so um, that's how they were used. And um, one of the ways that I get my buttons is on eBay. And when you lo are looking for bone buttons, you're really fighting against all those Civil War reenactors because they want to be very authentic. That's right. They, and they might have something missing a button like we all do. Right. Um, where were those made, bone buttons? It, uh, it, was there an area in the United States where they were manufactured, or was it mostly Europe? Most of our buttons have come from Europe, okay. um, England. We have buttons made in France and places like that. Okay. So yes, but most of them have. Very now, nice. when you talk about American buttons, I think that the most famous ones that we have, which were made in America, were okay. of course the George Washington. Um, when he was inaugurated in 1789, he was very specific. He wanted to wear um, metal buttons okay. with eagle on them. Okay. Unfortunately, we don't know the exact button to this day because they didn't take, they didn't have the digital cameras and everything that we do today. Um, so we don't know exactly, but manufacturers thought, you know what, we're going to produce lots of buttons because people will be very proud to show their respect of George and wear them. So here's an example of four different of the many designs of buttons from George Washington. Um, they were very popular at the time, and these are all replicas. These are not okay. original. Okay, and they're, um, but they were made. In, the originals were made in the United States. Yes, they were. He was very um, adamant about that. Even okay. the suit that he wore that day during his inauguration, and also the buttons had to be made in America. Yes. Got it. Okay. Um, and we know that William Rowlandson, he was a chaser. They say so. He used hammer and pounded up buttons. Was the one that actually made the buttons for him, and oh, he yeah. wouldn't take any money because he was so proud to work for the yeah, United States have him on president. The president of the United States. Okay. Right. Great. Right. Now, of course, I don't have a true George Washington but what I do have from that time is what what are called tomback buttons okay and those are these right here and you can see these are very plain but it was also what the people of the time could afford they might not be able to afford the silver buttons that Paul Revere was making they might not be able to afford those buttons but they could afford tomback Paul Revere was making buttons? Yes, he did. He made a lot of silver items. He also liked to be called a goldsmith. He actually thought of himself more of a goldsmith okay. than a silversmith. And he, he did make buttons. Yes, they've been found in his inventories. I'll be darned. That's yes. fascinating. Yes. So these are very, this is a brass alloy. It has lots of um, zinc in it and some copper in it. And you can see it's a very plain button, but really cool when you think that those buttons are 200 years old. 200. Wow. So yes. That is, that is kind of exciting. Now, George Washington was also very famous for other 
buttons. He was famous for pearl buttons. And there was a story there. Um, one day he was walking down the street and a sailor came up with a bunch of shells in a wheelbarrow and said, would you like to buy these? And they were <laughs> shells. And George was very frugal and he always wanted to use everything. And he said, well, what would I do with them? And he, the sailor said, make buttons. And he did that. He turned them into buttons. He'd wear them proudly on his okay. different suits of clothing. And so during the colonial times, shell buttons were very, very popular. Now, these ones up here are the colonial type shell pearls that we have. And then underneath are some of the more modern pearls, which okay. of course, until about 1960, they were still making a lot of pearl buttons. And then oh, 1960s was the change changeover when most of the factories be Left. Became plastic, yes. Plastic, yeah, yes, okay. They yeah. became plastic. So beautiful buttons. And buttons became a little more, a little, a little more or less important. I mean, buttons got to be just a matter of fact. Right. Kind of in the. And in the time that we're talking about, in the time of George Washington, in those times, they were considered very, very important. Yeah. And your status might be, you might have beautiful buttons on a, on yeah. your coat, and you were that was status. Right. I know that was true with canes. I had a cane collector on, and there was status involved in the style and the materials used and so on. Right. And the men wore them on their waistcoats. Yeah. Okay. And they say you could tell all about a man by based on the buttons that he had on okay. his waistcoat. Wow. So again, same ideas with, this, yeah. with the cane. All right. So those are, those are now answers. George also used his buttons. He was quite an interesting person um, for spy messages. Now what he did is they took covered buttons. Okay. And they put the message inside, and it was taken to George Washington. And there's a lot of stories about that. Some have been corroborated, some of them have not. But Urban definitely, legend. he was a spy master. And so buttons could be used in that way, too. So, wow. Yes. Yeah, so need to hide stuff, yeah. yeah. Now, back in England around the same time, um, we have what are called cut steels. Matthew Bolton was the one that kind of started out with these. He made a lot of jewelry. And that's in the UK? Yes. Okay. Birmingham, England. All right. Okay. And what happened, again, the wealthy wanted to have their buttons for themselves. They didn't want everyone to wear their buttons. Mm -hmm. And so they had what's called sumptuary laws. So you could not, unless you were a wealthy person, even in the United States we had these laws, you could not wear the most beautiful of the buttons. You had more of the more, of the more common buttons, like a fabric button. I wonder how they enforced that. I yeah. mean, I, I, well, they said that it was overthrown pretty quickly yeah. because <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty hard to enforce. Yeah. Um, but the cut steels came out then because look at the shine on them. You can see the oh, brilliance. Not, yeah. It's and um, so people were able to wear those cut steel buttons and look what they thought like very um, important and beautiful, and yet they were not made out of anything. And there's but some steel. real manufacturing techniques in these buttons. Yes, they almost look handmade. Each one of them, and I know they're done with stampings and dies and right. and so on. But these really have some intricate detail. Right, and at this time, probably the buttons were a lot of them were handmade. Okay. It wasn't until we moved into about the 1880s when you started getting the mass-produced buttons. Okay. So that is why they are beautiful. And again, they were made into jewelry. They, you know, it was, they weren't just made into buttons with the cut steel. But they really do shine, and that's, they have a lot of cartoons where the man is stunning the woman because of the radiance of his buttons. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I get that, it. Is, okay. that is a lot of fun. Um, so now, um, okay, what do you got when we move year? on a little bit farther in the timeline of history of buttons, we have our black glass. And when you think black glass, you have to think um, about 1860s. And the reason for that is Queen Victoria. Oh, okay. She lost Prince Albert in 1861, and she started wearing black everything. Oh. Now, she chose to wear black jet buttons. Jet's a fossilized material, very, very, very old. So the average person couldn't wear that, but they could wear black buttons. And so black glass became very, very, um, part of the style okay. and everyone in showing respect to her wore and, them. And where are these from in your, uh, are these UK and European buttons to, for, or American? These would be mixed up. Mixed. I, okay. I don't well, think. So yes. everybody got involved. Right. But what you'll notice, even though they're, one of the ways you can tell, you'll see some of them have what, like gold lusters here and silver lusters. They can be painted. They can be very different. And so what you have to do, what you learn with buttons is that you always have to turn them over and look at the back. Oh, okay. That's where you're going to learn a lot about a button. So on a black glass button, no matter what the front is, when you turn it over, you will find out that it's black glass, and that's how you determine. Okay. And another trick, in today's world, so many plastics look like glass. Sure. Oh, of course. So what, again, a button collector will do is they will take a glass button and tap it to their tooth. 
it and it has a more certain sound. musical yep. note. Right. Do, does anybody identify their buttons on the back with a stamp, like a name or a trademark? Definitely. Or a, okay. Oh yes, backmarked. Backmarked. And, okay. And that will tell you the era of the button. Some of those companies are still making buttons, so once you're able to read that backmark, nowadays with the computers, you can go on the internet and find out the history of the company and the history of the button and oh, date yeah. them. Well, that's cool. This is all valuable stuff to know. It is. It yeah. is. And so you should always turn a button over. People okay. don't realize that. Always it turn a button over. But again, even today, black glass, if you have your mom's buttons or your mother's, grandmother's button box, you're going to find black glass in them. It's yeah. one of the most yeah. common, most available button even to this day. Um, so they are awful beautiful also with all the different lusters and everything. Now, shortly after that, the 1860s, uh, we have the 1890s, and we have the gay 90s. And these are one of my favorite collections. And you'll notice that I have an empty spot. People always think, oh, there's a missing button. It's because I'm on the hunt to find that last button. So that is a group fill. of, what, what, what makes be, them, is the same the gay manufacturer? 90s. Or just um, no, in my case, well, they always tell you when you collect something, collect something that's a favorite of yours. Well, right. I, I love purple. Okay. Huh. So these all have to be purple from that time era, from like the 1890s. Okay. And we call them Victoria jewels, Victorian jewels, and that's because in the center there'll be either glass or in some cases actually a gem, and then around it is just the beauty of the button. Now forgive me for asking because I'm not clear on this. So those bigger buttons there, if you had a, a beautiful coat you were wearing, it would have a half a dozen of those buttons. No, in this case it would probably only have one or two. And it would just be like, a, but it has a button hole the size to yeah. handle that. Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Um, in fact, that was, buttons became popular not until really the, even though the oldest button is 5,000 years ago, shell button from Pakistan. Have you found one yet? Yeah, I don't have it, but they have found it. And the buttonhole didn't come to about 1250. Okay. So that's when we started using buttons for garments as opposed to decoration, which they had been used for before. Got it. Those, are, yes. those are really uh, These are interesting beautiful. looking I, yeah. little works of art. They are. They are. And they were worn, the clothes actually were kind of drab at that time, so the button is what, you know, really made it beautiful. And the ones, the purple ones, probably also came in other colors too, but your purple happens to be your interest. Favorite. Okay. Yes, greens, uh, reds, okay. yes. You can find them in all sorts of different colors, sure. but th okay. that's my collection. I have the purples. And all as right. I said, I'm looking for that last button that has to be the perfect size to fit on that mount. Uh, people are always worried that one of my buttons has fallen or been lost. Well, and, no, and that's the fun part is the hunt. I always like the hunt. It is. It is the fun part. So those are, um, those would be from like 1890. And then around that time, starting about 1880, we have what we call our picture buttons. And I know you mentioned that you are fascinated by the picture buttons yeah. also. Well, my, my family, my mother and two aunts, were really into picture buttons. In the 50s, they were collecting, 50s, 60s, 70s. Okay. Mostly 50s, 60s. And um, it was about in 19... Is, is that the same as a story button? I don't... Yes, it's, it's going to go on. We start with pictures and we'll move into stories. Okay. Okay. But just to give you an idea, when your mother and your aunts were collecting, um, the na we have a National Button Society, and it started in 1938. So it's actually 80 years old. Oh. But what's really neat, here in Michigan, we have the oldest state society. And it was oh. started in 1940. So okay. it would be perfect time. Yep, that's of right. Up the, uh, and it was in um, J.L. Hudson's. They met in J.L. Hudson's. It's interesting you say that because I was, as a young child, taken on the bus down to the Salvation Army, or to, and we'd, we'd also go to Hudson's and so on, but my aunt and my mother would stand on the loading dock when the stuff was being unloaded from the Salvation Army trucks and buy clothing from the guys unloading if it had a button they wanted. Okay. That's how they did it back then. I know, I know. And today, people still go to the Salvation Army. They love their, you know, discount days, and they yes. go. Um, and they, you know, if a garment's very old, you don't want to cut off the buttons. But if a garment has holes in it, right. things, we all know that the buttons yeah. were, were And it's cut not collectible off. on a garment itself, um, yeah. You know, so that is one place. Antique stores today still sell buttons, flea markets, but all these places have gotten very much aware about the value of buttons. So you don't find the treasures anymore yeah, there. Well, it's true with all everything we do right. because of communications. Are there buttons that are collectible from the 70s and 80s? Uh, you mean 1970s and 1980s? Yeah. yeah. They will become more collectible as time goes on. 
right. like anything. Yeah. The ones that I'm talking about are like pre-1918, so these are considered oh, antique. antique. And then in 1980, we switch over to modern. modern Sometimes we right. call them vin vintage to 1940, and then definitely modern. But that's right. kind of our division in the button world. Okay. Uh, so these are the beginning of what we call our picture buttons, 1880. These are mass produced. And of course, any picture that you can imagine was on the button. It didn't, I mean, they are larger. They were used on children's clothing and also adults' clothing. Oh, yeah. okay. And then, and then when you move into the story buttons, which is what you said, it was a way of showing, um, again, that you liked that story or that you were interested in that story. Now here's a mount right here. And these are the beginning of my story buttons. And these are all fables. Oh, okay. So on these, every one of them, you know, we have the ant and the grasshopper. You know, we have all the very famous, the fox and the crow. We have many different famous, the fox and the stork, all the different famous. I can imagine a young kid coming home and he's lost a button on a coat, that one of these buttons, and he would get scolded for, you know, for that. Right. And They're now, beautiful. In, in one of the things that we do in the Button Society, we do have a Michigan Button Society, we have six local clubs also here in okay. Michigan. Um, the club that I belong to meets at the Clinton Macomb Library okay. in Clinton Township, so very close, um, is we have competition. Oh. So we want to show our buttons. We want to take the time to mount them and get them out. Got and you it. can see on this board right You've here. You've won some things there. Yes, I won some Beautiful. things on this board Congratulations. right here. Congratulations. Yes, thank you. Um, so competition is very exacting, though. You have to have so many buttons. You have to have certain sizes. You have to have certain materials. Very exacting. It's, it's really, really hard to do. So I don't compete very often. But with my story buttons, because they're my favorite, I do tend to yeah. compete. So I was lucky. I did win, as you see, at just a second place down there. I call it just a second place. But then it was voted as being best of the show. Uh, so. I can see why. I can see why. Because you've got different types. You've got the brass, and you've got the um, you know, wood button, and you have a polymer clay button here, and fabric button. So you have many different types on that board. Uh, obviously, there's a lot to learn if you're going to be a button collector. Right. It's a real learning curve. Right. Just out of curiosity, uh, Sherry, have you got a button here or a group of buttons here that were you found in a particularly uh, unique way? And well, not on eBay and maybe in your rummaging around you found a certain button that's very special? Well, continuing on with those story buttons okay. and it, um, was my first set of buttons, which are the Beatrix Potter. Because again, I love Peter Rabbit, so by Beatrix Potter, who oh. was the English author that wrote Peter Rabbit. Okay, and okay. then somehow she had a, a license deal, and this was what? from um, JHB, which is a very big company, okay. sewing company. They are no longer in business, so you can't find these buttons anymore like you could right. when I could. I could actually go and, to the grocery, you know, the it, Joanne Fabrics. Is and buy the them. beauty of that is it's a one complete card of the original. Every everyone's on there that was on there in, at the store, so you could go. I want this one, this one, this one. Very rare because they would fall off or be sold, right? Right. And that is exactly right. And it took a long time to put this board together. I can't even remember how many years it took me. Um, but it was probably my first button, so you figure 15 years ago. And I think I finished it maybe two years ago. I'll be darned. That's and, dedication. Right. And it was actually published in the National Button uh, Bulletin because now other people are trying to find every one of the Beatrix Potter buttons. Oh. And why it's so special, the first button up here was my first button. And what happened, we have an online group called Button Bites. So you just talk to people online and learn. Like you say, there's so much learning. So I can ask questions of them, they can ask questions of me. And so the first time I attempted to type on it, I did ask a question, and I think my caps lock was on. Okay. And I wrote in capital letters. And uh, they had a moderator, and immediately she told me that that was unacceptable. And you know, I got yelled at by other people for doing that. And so one nice lady from Kansas wrote to me, and she said, you know, I'm so sorry. This is like the first time you've asked a question. And you know, obviously, you're feeling like you don't want to ask any more questions. Yeah. And so she ended up sending me my first. She said, what kind of buttons are you interested in? I said, Beatrix Potter. And so she sent me my first okay. Beatrix Potter button. This is a tough group. <laughs> Uh, well, you're not supposed to reply to the group. You know how those rules I do, I do. are. It's also so. very competitive, right, to find things. Very competitive. And if you hear of something, you want to get there fast. Very or competitive. Yeah, I'm sure it is. Okay. Um, so. How many members of the club here in, in this Southern Michigan club here? We in our Michigan club here, we have about 30 members. Okay. Okay, we also joined an up north club. That it's called the Bay Button Bunch. We're in Traverse City. All right. Because we have a home up that good way. Good excuse to go there. It is Excellent. exactly a good Excellent. excuse. Good. Next week we will be going for yeah. our meeting. So it's, and they only have about eight members up there. In Michigan, in total, we probably have about 150 members. Okay. Um, nationally, about 2,400 members. Uh, I'll be darned. Uh, out there. So. And you know, I have two of the early, early button books. I think they're from the 30s. 
I'm not positive. I'll tell you about it when I grab them and I'll write it down for you. Right, right. Well, we have a button encyclopedia. Okay. Uh, we have the big book of buttons, which is two volumes, and oh, libraries. Boy. You have to love interlibrary loan today because you can almost go to any library and get an interlibrary loan to you. Oh, my God. Um, unbelievable volumes that you said, where does the learning come in? You can start with books and then, of course, nowadays with the Internet. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, now, well, another uh, picture. The internet makes it much easier than it was at one oh, time. Yeah. Well, this is what's amazing about these buttons right here. These are, I'll show one more Beatrix Potter. One of the things that um, a button collector likes to do is mount their buttons. You've noticed that I've had many mounts. Right. This is what we call a creative mount. It doesn't follow any rules. Okay, you can do it other uncontrolled, than, whatever you want to do. Right, as as other than a 9 by 12 size, as we always do. Um, so these are my Beatrix Potters again, and based on the story, I put a little line, but Peter, who was very naughty, ran straight away to Mr. McGregor's garden and squeezed under the gate. So um, just a fun way, put it on your wall. We put them in shadow boxes so we get our buttons out so people can see them and enjoy oh, that's them. That's very important. Yeah. So that was part of my Beatrix Potter collection. So now um, I feel a little bit like I'm one of the students in your class because you're uh, you can tell you're a librarian teacher. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm and I'm absorbing most of this, not all of it. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, now these are called Kate Greenaway buttons. Okay. She lived around the time of Beatrix Potter, also in England. Children's story, 1879. Um, she had her first book called Under the Window. Okay. And these buttons, what's interesting about these, this was a competition card too, um, and what's interesting about these is every one of these buttons has to match an illustration in her book. Hmm. Very hard to do because button manufacturers would do things. They'd switch something or they'd add in their own idea. Um, I'm looking to see if there's one there. This one right here is called Little Patty and Her Playmates. Well, Little Patty is a very famous Kate Greenaway character. She's never really shown with goats. Okay. So is that a true Kate Greenaway? Well, is there different versions of that same button? There are many different versions of okay. all of these. Of all of these, okay. Size, um, okay. and again, they'll reverse a character or something like that. Um, recently, I was very lucky. There was one Kate Greenaway, and what you had mentioned before is that these ladies who did this research had no internet. We're talking 1879. A lot of letter writing, a lot of... Right. And they used the books. They had to go to libraries. They, you know. Yeah. And it's amazing. They, they have produced books on this and information. And I'm just fascinated that they could do so much without the internet. We get, we're spoiled. We by, are. By, we are. By the, now about, all collectors are spoiled now. Yeah. And the hunt is part of, my biggest interest is the hunt, finding things and right. digging them up. And, right. And then the research that goes with that hunt, because I just love learning about sure. it all. Um, recently, about a year ago, I had a Kate Greenaway that was question marked. So I spent, again, probably two years searching through online now. I would like look at her books and read them online and to try to find the matching illustration. And I was able to do that about a year ago and that was published and it's now considered a bona fide Kate Greenaway button, which was really exciting. Yeah, so you've proved it. Yeah. Right, I have pro proven it. So these are absolutely gorgeous. Um, yeah, they are. Buttons, and they're again part of that story. You mentioned the story picture buttons. Yeah. So now the other things that I brought were just very general. I know okay. in coming you saw the beautiful paperweights. Uh, many people collect paperweights. You mentioned you had a special paperweight. Yep, I do. And these are paperweight buttons. And yep. again, they are really beautiful. They have to have either two or three pieces. They have to have what we call a setup. And then, of course, the top part. And where were these manufactured? Um, some of them, interesting that you asked that. This one right here is a very recent paperweight made right here in the United States. Um, we have what are called studio buttons. Meaning a, an art studio of someone yes. designed them and then they... That's right. They're never then, made for collectors. Oh. Uh, they're made for collectors. They're not made to be worn. Okay. So that would be a very recent one made. Germany had a lot of your glass. Did a lot of glass came from Germany also. So these would be a mix again from you know, the United States and Germany. Now when we talk about studio, let me show you down here. Um, Here's kind of an interesting tray right here. I'm going to put these over back over here. Um, of all, again, going back to that storybook theme of all Humpty Dumpty buttons. Okay. But these are all studio buttons, so no one would have ever worn these. They were made for the collector. The first one right here is a movable Humpty Dumpty as arms and legs move. And it was made by my husband. Uh, once I got into buttons and he kind of had a 
go button shows with me. He started getting an interest. He had always worked in polymer clay. Oh. Okay. So he made that out of polymer clay. This one right here is made, it's a paperweight. We were just talking okay. about those by John Gooderham. He lived in Canada. He was kind of, we consider him a Michigan studio artist because he was so close. Yes, right. Um, again. And then these last two are Scrimshaw. So again, you talked about the art style. It's almost anything you can do. Now, Scrimshaw, I think of it as 100 years ago. Is that new or old? These are new. Um, these are made by okay. Diane Shefferly, also from Michigan. Okay. And she probably made them in the range of 70 some years ago. So she used the technique of Scrimshaw okay, got and it. did it on Mother of Pearl buttons. So we see a lot of our button artists will use the Scrimshaw and make buttons. But again, they were made for collectors. So they are beautiful, and I do enjoy them, and they do. I had no idea that somebody there was studio buttons made for collectors. Right. I always thought they were always salvaged from use. Right. So that's you know new information right. to me. Right, and I, you know I'll show you one more because I see that we're getting close on time here. <laughs> um, and these are paste buttons. And I think in those, um, you know, it's fake glass is what okay. they really are. Okay. And in those like button jars. Jewelry. Yes. And in those button jars, you know, that we had a lot of paste buttons back then. And I know as a little kid, I loved playing with them. And this is probably one of my most popular boards. It's glittery. Kids still love it to this day. Everyone loves the shine of a paste button. Yeah, they're, they're something else. Right, right. They look like real jewels. Right. And that's why, again, in making them decorative to so hang at the house, we, you know, we put it inside a treasure chest. My husband is paints also, so he, did, he does the backgrounds for me. We kind of work at this together. Yeah, good. It looks yes. nice. Very nice. Yes. And he makes buttons, too. That's yes, he does. He, he got he, into it. He does. He does oh, beautiful good. buttons. That's good. Well, Sherry, we've all learned something in this past 30 minutes about buttons that i never knew and a lot of people don't know and they're absolutely beautiful and thank you for coming into the show here today we appreciate i appreciate it we appreciate it thank um, you if anybody has any questions for sherry or myself please contact me or you want to bring in a collection in and talk about it happy to have you on the show to talk about your collection contact me at um, bctv the collectors at gmail.com and thanks for watching. Thank you for having me here.